Hi, I'm Joost Krieger. I'm fascinated with architecture. When I was young, just a little kid, this is me, five years old, already building things. And I was mainly fascinated by ancient monuments and skyscrapers. But during my studies, I learned, figured out that most of our building production isn't necessarily sustainable. And when I discovered this small Dutch architecture practice that was working in a different way, in a traditional take on architecture, I decided to do an internship there, and I'm glad I was accepted. I'm there still, I'm one of the four partners right now. And I'll take you on a small journey on the kind of work we've been doing. During my internship, we started a project with wind turbines. Wind turbines are one of the main icons of the sustainable energy movement. But have you ever wondered how they are made? The projection, production of a wind turbine is a combination of technological precision and manual labor. Rotor blades can reach lengths up to 90 meters, and they keep getting bigger. Teams work together to put layers of glass fiber before an epoxy resin is put on top. The half blades that are finished are put together to make a single one, and they will harvest the wind for years to come. This is one of my colleagues. Usually, after a wind turbine ends its life, the blades are sent to a local yard and will be recycled or shredded for landfill. And that kind of looks like this. So we've invested a lot of time and energy to make these beautiful products, and then we just shred them to, to bits. And we figured, isn't there a better way to put this to use? And we decided to make playgrounds. This was our first blade-made project. It's in Rotterdam. We started it in 2006, finished it in 2008. And it's just five blades of 25 meters long, four of them chopped to pieces to make sure that all the broken bits were taken out, and one of them at full length. And the one at full length, at the heart of the playground, it becomes a table where children and parents can have their lunch. But when there's no adults around, this can be a place where children walk the plank of a ship and jump in the chipped wood ground cover. And these five plates together create an imaginative space, a space where children are not forced to be on a ship or forced to be in a castle. They can be anything. They can be on a spaceship and they can be in a rabbit's hole. And this, this kind of working is really something else. And what we never would have been able to conceive is the inside of these spaces. This is something that is only there because it was precisely engineered before that we found it. So, the 1.4 meter high opening of one of, the, one of those blades makes sure that children can run inside. And once they're inside, the space gradually becomes smaller and they have to crawl through. Holes are put in places where we either wanted them for the space that we created or where, are they, where they are required by regulations. Because this playground, just like any, any other, had to comply to the health and safety rules in the Netherlands. New Zealand has about 500 wind turbines, which means probably around 1,500 rotor blades. With an average lifespan of 15 years, that means that there will be around 100 blades that are discarded every year. Just every year, we could make 20 playgrounds just like this in New Zealand alone. And this is a global problem. And it's not just a beautiful space. We can save around 90% on carbon emissions compared to a normal playground made out of stainless steel and FSC certified wood. Of course, not all blades will have the right size for a playground. This installation in Rotterdam is a piece of urban furniture where about 50 people can be seated ranging from a group of tourists or students when they are on an excursion in Rotterdam. The aerodynamic shapes make for an ergonomic sitting environment. And when the blades are too big to use in a playground, they could be used as a place marker. For example, this one in a recycling center in Maastricht, in the south of the Netherlands. And the main reuse item in this project is not the rotor blade, it's the window frames and the steel sheet offcuts. Currently, we are working on a bus shelter in Almere, close to Amsterdam. And later this year, 
a playground will open into Neusen along the Dutch coast. So there are plenty of possibilities to transform these materials into something more useful than just landfilling them. Throwing them away is a real waste of potential. Our work with wind turbines is part of a core philosophy we call superuse. It's the idea that waste materials can and should be a rich source for architectural transformation. To increase our impact, we developed this platform called the Harvest Map. It's an online database where people can share their knowledge about waste materials and share the sources where to find them. We act as a mediator between a possible source and the customer. To, de to develop our projects with the superuse method it takes us years of research and development. But we can do it in small steps. I'll take you along one of these materials, which is the cable reel. Usually wooden cable reels are sent to wood recycling after their life. When we found a good source, we discovered that they are quite easy to take apart. It's just a few bolts and the wooden slats in the middle fall out, and you can collect them. Our first project in 2001 was a small ferry on a canal in Rotterdam. It gave us the first insight on what you can do with them, what to avoid, and what to put them to use for. Our next project was this installation for a festival in Amsterdam. It's not just these cable reels, but it's figuring out how they are made, what elements they consist of, and how to put them to use. One person could run on top of this, while another one would brace himself on the inside, which essentially meant that we build a human tumble dryer. But I'd like, you, like to take a closer look at these small metal parts. They are quite nice and just a part of the mechanism that holds the cable reel together. Can you find them in our next project? It's a restaurant in Amsterdam where we put all our cable reel knowledge to good use, combined with elements from Schiphol Airport. And it's not just this wooden arc where we use the wood, but I'd like to focus on the tables. The metal slabs of the tables are, were once the sides of a cable reel. And the legs of the table are the rods that kept it together. In the middle, there was a hole, and that's the perfect place for a bottle of wine and a wine cooler. And here on the ground are the feet, the same metal elements that I've showed you before. So everything of a cable reel can be reused. Our mission within SuperU Studios is to pioneer these materials and to bring them to the realm of buildings. This is Villa Velpelo, a single family dwelling in the Netherlands that we built in 2009 for an art collecting couple. The whole facade is made of the wood of about 200 cable reels, harvested just 15 kilometers from the building site. Our ambition to superuse materials doesn't stop at what is in plain sight. The inside of the kitchen cabinets is made from building, at, uh, building site advertisement boards. And the steel structure that is mostly hidden uses out of 90% reused st steel, saves around 90% of carbon emissions as well. Same goes for the facade, with an even better carbon performance, where almost 95% was reached. But, for example, with the cable reels, these small irregularities enhance the building. They add, they break the repetition, and they add to the beauty and uniqueness of the structure. Superuse projects can range from permanent buildings and interiors to quick temporary installations. This is not just a pile of trash. This is a source for material. When we were asked to make an installation in Cittadella in Italy, we were told that there was a limited budget, so we decided to do a project within a week. We went over there with a team of three people. I had to come from Rome and couldn't bring any tools. One person came from Amsterdam by plane and couldn't bring any. And the last one came by train, the international train, and brought all the equipment we might need. On Monday, when we arrived on site, the organizers had selected a few harvest locations for us to visit. And we harvested four oak coat racks, 22 window frames from a local contractor, and some pieces of metal. And by Monday evening, we had our design ready. By Tuesday, we started product, produ uh, the production of the elements we needed. And on Wednesday, we had three of these elements, the corner pieces, 
with a seat for stru structural stability and functionality. But when lying on the ground like this, it could be your solar-powered sauna. <laughs> on Thursday, we erected the pavilion. And this small installation uh, wasn't completely finished. So one of us went to an industrial site in the neighborhood and found a piece of fabric to create the roof. We added all the finishing touches. And on Friday, we only had to clean the woodwork and the windows, and we could open it. So the official opening was on Friday night, just after a week work. And what I'd like you to take from this is that these projects don't have to be expensive, long-term installations. When you start to listen to the material, it will work with you to create something beautiful and functional. To succeed in making a super, successful super-use project, you have to reverse parts of your design process. First, source materials. Find out what quantity is available, how you can transform it, and then start your design. This is exactly what we wanted the students to experience during FESTA, which took over Christchurch last weekend, just like TEDx does right now. I've had a great time being involved as a creative director. The assignment for the 200 plus students was to design and build an installation reusing waste materials that was clever, contained spectacle, could be installed in a couple of hours, and be deinstalled even quicker. Important for all of them was to keep their end-of-life solution clear. We didn't want the installations to cre create any waste. 18 installations were made by students from Christchurch, Wellington, Auckland, but not just that, also Adelaide, Sydney, and Melbourne. I'm going to show you just a few of them. The students of ARA in Christchurch have cooperated with Juliet Arnold from Christchurch to create this installation out of locally harvested hazel. They were the only one to use biological waste materials, which is also a good source. The installation was open during the whole weekend, and it was a zero-waste life village, so people could experience what that could be like. And it was a combination of craftspeople making traditional objects like wooden spoons and products that enhance the sustainable lifestyle. Everything in the installation will be reused again by Juliet Arnott in future displays of a zero-waste village. A perfect end-of-life solution. Some, some groups have been using plastic consumer waste to create their installations. For example, this group from Unitech, who transformed plastic bags and bottles to a six-meter-high waterfall. During my visit in July, they showed a sketch design after just two weeks of design work. And they actually managed to pull it off to create this amazing installation that looks just like that. It's amazing. The finished result was one of the nighttime highlights of FESTA this year. I couldn't have imagined hundreds of plastic bags could look this beautiful together. Unfortunately, their end-of-life solution was still sending it to plastic recycling. Another group from Unitech used just plastic bottles. They are hung inside this triangular structure out of super-used construction props. These structures have been provided to a lot of the groups by the team behind FESTA. The plastic bottles moving in the wind made an interesting, interesting soundscape during the day. And in nighttime, the translucent bottles soak up the light of the LEDs underneath them. It must have surely been photographed at least a thousand times during the night. All the plastic bottles have been sent to plastic recycling, and the construction props are sent back to the company that provided them for the festival. Students, putting plastic waste to good use doesn't stop there, since another group from Unitech decided to use bottles, but in a different way. We provided them with a structure of purlins that had been produced wrongly, becoming waste before they were ever used. The structure has been wrapped in strings that are cut from plastic bottles. When the darkness set, the tunnel of rotating squares came alive with the strings reflecting the LED lighting. Again, all the plastic has been sent to recycling, apparently the best end-of-life solution for plastic consumer waste around at the moment. But the whole structure, on the contrary, will become an overgrown pavilion in a community garden enrichment. The University of South Australia team decided to use these yellow bags. They found them on the harvest map that was started for FESTA. The bags are dead stock because of, because of the wrong logo. So they are new, but destined for landfill. The installation of almost 2,500 bags 
has been, that ha um, have been hung inside the standard structure. The sheer amount provides a confronting look into how nothing becomes something that impacts our planet. The use of just one plastic bag seems inconsequential, but when you see them together, it creates a whole different outlook. A number of the bags will be taken back to Adelaide for their graduation show. However, still around 20,000 bags remain in Christchurch, waiting for a better life than landfill. You can find these bags on the harvest map we created for Festa. But it's not just for Festa, this is yours. You can create an account and list the waste material as you know. Please explore the map and grow the database and find inputs for your next projects, whether it be your garden shed or a house or an office. It's free to use for all of you. After this story about the impact of architecture and carbon reduction, you might wonder why I came all the way from Amsterdam to tell you this story. I hope and believe that I can carbon offset my flight by inspiring you to treat your waste materials differently, look at the true potential, and give them a super useful second life. Thank you.